What is this place where we are meeting? Only a house, the earth is its floor, walls and a roof, sheltering people, windows for light, an open door, yet it becomes a body that lives when we are gathered here and know that our God is near. Good morning and welcome to worship at College Mennonite Church. We are glad you are here in this place or watching on channel 13 at Greencroft, listening to WGCS The Globe Radio, or watching by live stream. Welcome. I am Sam Brenneman, a fifth grader at Bethany. I am Everett Thomas, church board chair, but more importantly, I am Sam's grandfather. He calls me Pop. Together, we welcome you on this, the last Sunday of the year. Wait, what? Pop, how is this the last Sunday of the year? It's not even December yet, and Thanksgiving is next week. Well, here at College Mennonite Church, we observe four different years. The only one I know starts on January 1st. We have a budget year, which we call the fiscal year. We've got the Sunday school year, which starts on September 1. And we have the church year, which follows the lectionary and ends today. So next Sunday starts a new church year? Yes, and today is the last Sunday of the current lectionary year. We'll call it Harvest Sunday, since we're inviting everyone to bring something to this table later for a harvest offering. So next Sunday begins a new church year and is the first Sunday of Advent. And then after three more Sundays, it's Christmas, Exactly, right? exactly. So let's start this Harvest Sunday with a call to worship. Sam and I will read the leader parts in English and ask you to read the responses in Spanish. Jesus calls, to, uh, to, calls us to praise and to prayer, to song and silence. Jesus, Jesus calls us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus. Jesus calls us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Jesus. We hear the call of Christ. We, we worship, worship together, together with, with joy. joy. Let's sing number 122 in Voices Together. Sing to the God of Harvest. And as you're able, please stand.
Our next song is number 115, Praise Be to God. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, this Thanksgiving week, we give you thanks for the fruits of the earth in their season and for the labors of those who harvest them. Make us faithful stewards of your great bounty for the provision of our necessities and the relief of all who are in need. You have linked our lives with one another so that all we do affects other lives. Guide us in the work we do that we do not labor for self alone, but for the common good. You desire that all come to know you. Inspire the witness of your church that all may know the power of forgiveness and the hope of resurrection. In your perfect kingdom, no sword is drawn except the sword of righteousness, no strength but the strength of love. Spread your spirit abroad that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as your children. By your Holy Spirit, enlighten those who teach and those who learn, that they may rejoice in the knowledge of your truth and worship and serve you from generation to generation. Bless immigrants and refugees seeking a more secure life. Walk with those who even now are on this difficult journey. Keep them safe and in your loving care. Place your servants along the way to encourage them 
and give them hope. Comfort and relieve those of your servants who are sick and give your power of healing to those who minister to their needs. We ask that those for whom we pray be strengthened in their weakness and have confidence in your loving care. We pray especially for Sandra Hess, the Mel family, Margot Bressler, Hank Weaver, Albert, Ed Hempel, and Lucia Conway. We pray for the comfort of those who mourn, remembering especially Carl Yoder and the family of his brother Solomon, Juan Toge and his family at the death of an infant child, Sherry Williams and her family at the death of her husband, Mitchell, Luke Berkey and his family at the death of his son, Steve, and the family of Florence Hirschberger. We pray for parents and for children, and especially for new parents, Margaret and Lance Hall, at the birth of baby Lucy. We pray for all the concerns of our hearts, even those unnamed here. We remember that you know us better than we know ourselves, and through your Holy Spirit, our true desires and wishes are revealed. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. This time I want to invite families to come forward for the children's time. And we are going to sing together. We're going to sing them in. We're going to sing, Oh, Sing to the Lord. And sing uh, in whatever language you are, you, you want to sing. I was going to say comfortable, but whatever language you want to sing, sing in that language. It's Voices Together number 113. And in worship, we had a story about a prophet named Elijah and a woman who was a widow and had a son, and there was kind of a miracle story with oil. This week, we have a story about a prophet named Elisha, and there is a woman who is a widow, and she has two sons. And there's a story with oil. Do you think that maybe Phil and the people who put together the Sunday School curriculum got just a little mixed up and accidentally did the same story twice? No? No? You don't think so? You trust Phil a little more than that? 
I do too. (laughs) There are two prophets named Elijah and Elisha, and when I was growing up, I got these two so mixed up. Because they were, they were prophesying kind of in the same broad time frame of history. And some of their stories are a little similar to each other. But today's is a little bit different, and we're going to tell it now. So this is my mom, and she's going to help with this story. Now, a member of the company, uh, uh, the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. That's not good, is it? Malachi and Miles, can you come be her two children? Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. He said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, not just a few. Then go in, shut the door behind you and your children, and start pouring into all these vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she left him, shut the door behind her and her children, and they kept bringing vessels to her. Can you go collect all the vessels? Just bring them up here. Go get them all. Find as many as you can. And she just kept pouring. Do all of it. Yep. She's going to fill those vessels right up. We got lots of vessels to collect. Keep them coming. Doing great, Mom. <laughs> there, oh, there are even more. I think I counted 19. So you've got a few vessels to fill, a few vessels to pick up. Good. There's a song that this makes me think of. You're going to understand why it makes me think of it in a little bit. I think you might be able to help me sing it. There's enough for all if we will learn to share it. There's enough for all if we will learn to see. There's enough for all. Let's bring our loaves and fishes and offer them to Jesus. There's more than enough for you and me. There's enough for all. If we will learn to share it, there's enough for all. If we will learn to see, there's enough for all. Let's bring our loaves and fishes and offer them to Jesus. There's more than enough for you and me. All right, do we have all the vessels? Anyone have any left? Okay. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there are no more. And then the oil stopped flowing. So she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your children can live on the rest. And so she sold the oil and paid her debts and was able to care for her children. So questions here. Did the woman take care of her her struggles that she had? She had some problems. Did she take care of those all by herself? No. Who, Who took care of her problems? Yeah. Her, yes, her children helped. Yeah, who else? The neighbors, yeah. When, when you two were going around and getting these cups from people, did they say, um, no, I need to keep my vessel, thank you very much. They just handed them to you, didn't they? And it sounds in the story like they didn't have to ask too many times. What else? Someone else had something to add. Did anyone else help? What do you think? God. God. Yeah, I think God was probably quite heavily involved in this story. And Elisha, he was helpful. Yeah, Miles. Why didn't she just sell the container of oil? Phil, we're going to talk about that in your sermon. Maybe we'll see. That's a great question. You do a little thinking about that, and I'd like to hear what you come up with. Thank you for asking about vessels. That's a weird word, isn't it? So that's, that's the word that's used often in the Bible that means usually we think it's probably something made out of clay 
um, out of pottery. And back then, um, they didn't have disposable little cups like this. So you would use your pottery instead. But when we say vessel in the Bible, it usually means just something made out of clay that holds, that can hold liquid or whatever it is that you need it to hold. Well, here's another question. Do you think that the woman got rich off of this oil? No. No, I don't think so either. She had enough, didn't she? Not much, just enough. They're not rich off of it. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. Well, today, we have an opportunity to do something that also helps with having enough. Being part of a church community also means that we and others around us work together so that all have enough. None of us, no human being has absolutely everything they need. Some people have enough money for what they need, but maybe need some relationships. We all need things outside of ourselves. And part of being in the church is that we give and take. And it's also that we give and take with each other so that our lives are richer and more diverse. So there are things that I learn from other people that my family can't learn all by ourselves. Or even things like, maybe I had a wonderful squash harvest this year, but we, don't, we didn't grow a lot of things besides squash. Now, do you think my family wants to eat squash the entire winter? Would you like to eat squash the entire winter? There are different types of squash, but what if all I have is butternut squash? Ugh. I mean, I like, my, my, I like a little bit of butternut squash, but not the entire winter. But maybe someone else had a really good harvest of berries, and they've done some preserving with those. And maybe they don't have squash, but I can give them squash, and they can give me berries. So today, we have our harvest offering, and this is where we come and we bring the fruits of our labors. That does not mean it's all fruit. That means it's the things that the, that the work we were doing and what God was doing in our lives this year, these are some of the things that grew out of that, that came from that. We bring those, and then we all take something different, and then we all have enough. And one thing that's really cool is that after Sunday school, you get to come back in here, and we are all going to take from the harvest table with our siblings in the second worship service. And so we'll get to come back in here and sing and take gifts from the table with all of them after Sunday school. So some of you brought some things for the harvest offering. And even if you did, I invite you to do one more thing. I have some supplies here. And I'm going to move this table back there as, as we have a little music after this. I invite you to follow me and get some art supplies. And you can create something during worship to bring up to the harvest table during the ho- harvest offering. And if you find that you need a different supply or more supplies during the rest of the worship service, you are welcome to come back to the cart and get what you need, okay? All right, let's pray together. God, thank you for all of the gifts of this earth. You've created enough to sustain life here on earth. And you put us in this community of people worshiping you and sharing so that we all have enough. Bless the gifts that we bring today And help us to be on the lookout for helping each other. In Jesus' name, amen.
Phil Waite, our pastoral team leader, will bring the message today. Let's pray for Phil. Oh God, by your spoken word, you created everything that is. By your incarnate word, you redeemed us. By your comforting word, you are with us still. Prepare us now to hear your word to us this day. Amen. Before we pass the peace, I just want to say, just say a few words uh, that we are all, we are in red now in Elkhart County, which is probably something you probably, you, you all probably knew that, right? That we are in, we are in red. And you came anyway, even with the rain. Others maybe said, no, you know, I think with the rain and with being in red, I'm going to, get, I'm going to be more cautious for a little while, and that's okay. So some of you are watching uh, from home and you haven't been watching at home maybe for, for a little while. Some of you maybe are here uh, for the first time. As we pass the piece, I, just, I want us to be mindful of that and maybe be a little more careful than, than you've been in the past. We, we, that I know of, we have had no spread on Sunday morning. I'm not aware of any spread that we've had here at College Mennonite, and I think that's because of, we have high rates of vaccination, we are masked, and we have really great ventilation in this room. Remember, we were, rem- rem- we were reminded of that when the alarm went off over the summer. Remember that? That was because of... Uh, because we have the ventilation on max. So, so there's some really good things uh, that we have going for us that make us safe. So I want to encourage, you, encourage all of you here who've, who've come here that, that you can feel good about being safe. But as we pass the peace, maybe we should not do the hugs and maybe focus more on the elbow bumps and that kind of thing. So just, just a suggestion. I want to I, I wanna make a special uh, welcome. We don't usually introduce guests, but Glenn Guyton, the executive director of Mennonite Church USA, is with us this morning. And uh, so welcome, Glenn. We're really glad you're here. If you get a chance to see him, uh, welcome him in an appropriate way. Can't. Uh, but he's here to speak in the Sojourners class, which is open to any of you to attend, and it's hybrid. So I think that there might be a way, even at this late hour, for you to get on and join. Am I speaking out of turn, Del? Okay. So you can join, even if you're not here, you can join the Sojourners class and hear uh, Glenn Guyton and welcome you to do that. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us greet each other with the peace of Christ. such a wonderful sound. I, have, I just simply don't have the heart <laughs> to cut it off. Our scripture this morning is from 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. Now the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. 
And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. He said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your children and start pouring into all these vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her and she kept pouring. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there are no more. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your children can live on the rest. The word of the Lord. I was on the campus of an elite university on a weekend. And I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna, I'm trying really hard not to give clues as to where this place was, but I will tell you, it was not Goshen College. <laughs> and that's not to say that Goshen College is, you don't get an elite education at Goshen College, it's just to make it clear that it was not here, because it could be scandalous. That kind of raises your attention, doesn't it? So I, w I was in a public area, uh, I was by myself, and a man came up to me who I learned was a senior, an undergraduate student, and he was drunk, I think. He was under the influence of something. I'm not entirely sure all that was going on, but he was uh, clearly spending the weekend doing whatever, it was, consuming whatever it was he was consuming that made him... Uh, lowered his inhibitions, let's put it that way. He was very warm and friendly, and you know how it is sometimes when, I don't know if you've had the experience of people who are, in, strangers who are intoxicated, intoxicated come up to you in a, in a public space, and you know, that can make you feel kind of nervous if that's ever happened to you. I, I was not nervous, so something about him made me feel uh, that, this, that, that I was secure. And he said, well, what's your story? Well, I'm a Mennonite pastor from Goshen, Indiana. Oh, that's interesting. What's your story? And he begins to tell me his story, or parts of his story. He was a student, a senior at this elite institution. He was, a, he was an engineering major. And he he said, was miserable. He apologized for his state, the state of intoxication. He said, this is, the, this is the only way that I can cope, is to take uh, the time that I have to be with my friends and to, I'm going to assume, drink alcohol as a way to manage the stress, the misery of my life. He said, I am Miserable. You don't know what it's like. He said, my siblings weren't smart enough to get into this school. I think his, he was a legacy student. His parents went to this school. Uh, uh, my, my, my siblings weren't smart enough to get into this school, and I have a job lined up for me at the end, uh, end, of, end of the year, and, and I'm just trying to get through to the end of this. Now, I want to say clearly so that y'all don't get confused, that I'm not opposed to going to elite institutions. 
I'm not opposed to engineering majors or uh, pursuing that course of study, and I'm not opposed to doing something that's hard, to making a, a sacrifice for, for, uh, for something in the future. And all of those things were at play in this young man's life. But there was something in him of what I would call existential dread, of almost a cry for help, like, I am on this path, I got on this path, I don't know what to do. I had to get the best grades to get into this school, I had to get the best test scores to get into this school so that I could get the best job, so that I could make the most money, so that I could have the biggest house, so that I could be in the best neighborhood, so that I could drive the fastest cars or the fanciest cars, so that I could go on the most luxurious vacations, so that I could send my kids to elite educational institutions. Something had gotten a hold of this man's life and wouldn't let go. It, it, it reminds me of a, we're going to pivot here, a little, this might be a little jarring, it reminds me of performance enhancing, the performance enhancing drugs scandal in baseball. I, I don't know, you may, may or may not care about this. Um, I, I, I lived in Chicago in the Sammy Sosa era of the Chicago Cubs, so it's painful, it's a painful topic. Uh, performance enhancing drugs and and they were rampant in in baseball players were using steroids that harmed their bodies so that they could get an edge and uh, baseball uh, pro professional sports such an elite level professional sports such an elite level and it's really really hard to get there and and, and the margins are really tiny um, from being kind of, meh, not quite, to being just a little bit more and making crazy amounts of money. I, uh, back, in, uh, back in the day, the minimum baseball salary, back in the day of the height of the performance enhancing drug scandal, the min minimum salary was, of a major league baseball player was $500,000 a year. Now that's yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good salary, I think, for most people, $500,000 a year. The salary for a minor league baseball player was almost peanuts, literally. You, you got money from day to day, you maybe made, um, you maybe made $15,000 a year, something like that. I mean, it was, it was minimum, minimum wage, yeah, and the rationale was, well, you can go off in the off season and, and make money, but increasingly players were expected to train all season long, all year round. So, so the incentive, the incentive to use performance enhancing drugs was extreme. And in a society like ours that values money above everything else and everything that money can buy, for these players, it would almost be a moral failure, a moral failure not to use performance-enhancing drugs. When they had within their ability the opportunity to make that kind of money and they didn't take it, woe be to them. Given the values given what matters, given what we care about, given what is a meaningful life in the society in which we live. A meaningful life is not the life of a minor league baseball player. It is the life of a major league star. The 1966 Broadway musical Cabaret has a song, and I'm not going to try to sing it because I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> um, Money makes the world go round, the world go round, the world go round. Money makes the world go round. It makes the world go round. We have, there are two stories involving the prophet Elisha about, wait for it, money. 
The first one uh, we, we heard about in the children's time, and I read it from, from the text, and it's kind of, it's, 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 when I read it, it's, it's like, this is really striking because, it's, because the language is really kind of earthy, down-to-earth kinds of language that we can identify with. And I'm gonna, so it's, it's, it's an intriguing story to me. Uh, and I compare and contrast it with some other stories. I, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Th- that food was not for sale, it was a gift. So it's one of those stories, one of those rare stories where the gifts of God are monetized. Where God's gifts, where a miracle is literally turned into money. It's turned into a liquid, no, I got oil, liquid asset. (laughs) It's turned into a liquid asset that gets turned into a liquid asset. How about that? The oil and all these vessels get... Get, 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 gets poured out and poured out and poured out and poured out until it's sold to repay the debts of this widow so that her children don't, get, don't have to be sold into slavery. And that's what happens. And they have enough to live on the rest so they don't have to go into debt again just to, just to survive. God's gifts are used for a specific purpose, a sacred trust in the context of a sacred social order. The gifts of God for the people of God. The other story in Elisha that I want to compare the story to, the, the compare and contrast, favorite, favorite question of, of English teachers everywhere, compare and contrast. Um, the, the, uh, the uh, Aramean, Syrian uh, general, Naaman, has leprosy, and he learns that there's a prophet in Israel who can heal him. And he goes to Israel, and he tracks down Elisha. This is the high-speed version of the story. If you want to read the, the full thing, it's in, it's in 2 Kings chapter 5. So Naaman comes to Elisha, and Elisha says, okay, Go and uh, dunk yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman says, well, I don't want to do that because there are such nice, nicer rivers uh, back in Damascus where I'm from. But then he has a change of heart and he goes and he does this, dunk, dunks himself in the Jordan River seven times and he's healed. And he goes back to Elisha. Says, Thank you so much. What can I give you? What kind of wealth? What kind of money, what kind of assets can I give you to express my thanks? And Elisha says, God's gifts are not for sale. I'm not going to do that. That's not what we do here. It is, a, it is a free gift of God. Just remember that there is a God in Israel. So Naaman says, wow, okay. And he, he goes back on his way and he says, he says I know that now and, that's, that's, and I'm, when I go back to Damascus, I am going to worship, worship the true God. Well, Elisha's servant, Gehazi, isn't very happy with what Elisha said. There's an opportunity cost here, Gehazi thinks. I can make, uh, make some, some money off of this, and this foreigner, this Syrian, I mean, why should we care about him? And so Gehazi tracks down Naaman, chases after him and says, oh, um, change of plans? Um, we want some loot, uh, please. Uh, and they were like, well, sure, well, how much do you want? So Gehazi takes all the loot that he can get, market value maybe for the healing of leprosy, maybe above market rates, I'm not sure. Certainly not below. And he goes back to Elisha. 
Now, Elijah's wise to this thing, to what's going on. And he calls Gehazi to account. But you see the difference between these two stories. In the one story, God's gifts are monetized to serve particular purposes that God cares about. God's gifts, the gifts that God has given to us, are for specific purposes. The care of a community. In the Gehazi story, Gehazi believes that these gifts are for accumulating excess capital. Capital that's not needed. I think back a lot on that story, the story of the um, intoxicated young man who came to me. Uh, and these two stories put it all in a different kind of light for me. And I feel not a sense of judgment, but a sense of deep sadness. We live in, we live in a Gehazi world. We serve mammon, money. Jesus used the word mammon to talk about money, a god personified. We worship mammon. We will do anything for mammon. We are enslaved, dare I be so bold to say, to mammon. And that young man, I imagine his soul is tormented. I imagine a tormented soul. And I just want to say, there is something better. God loves you more than that. God has something for you that is much greater than that. And I look at my own soul. Mammon's powerful. Mammon is, mammon is seductive. It's a powerful force. And I want to examine my own soul. How have I internalized the values of mammon? How have I participated in the cult of mammon? How have I worshipped mammon in my own life? But the concern does not take me to judgment, at least not in the way that we think about judgment, does not take me to a place of harshness, does not take me to this place of, what were you thinking to that man? What were you thinking? Why did you do that? takes me to a place of praying for him, and I pray for him. And I pray that Jesus will reveal to him the words that he spoke in the New Testament. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Come to me and I will give you rest. Mammon is brutal. Mammon is a, is a task driver. Mammon will destroy you. Mammon will make you work overtime. Mammon will, doesn't, doesn't want you to keep the Sabbath. Mammon wants you to keep on going. Mammon will make you sacrifice your health, your well-being, your family, your religion. That's what mammon wants. And Jesus' response to that is, come unto me and I will give you rest. Amen.
we're invited to sing the words from Zephaniah. The Lord, your God, is with you. Number 173 and Voices Together. After the introduction, we'll sing this song through twice, and then we'll hear the, inter the interlude, and then we'll sing it one more time. We come now to that special act of worship, the giving of our tithes and offerings, and today they will be plural. As usual, you can come forward to place your regular offerings in the baskets. You can also come forward with your harvest offerings and place them on the table or the floor, and children, that includes you with what you've been making. Then come back into the sanctuary at 11.50, not 11.15, 11.50, and greet our sisters and brothers in the 11.11 service and receive from the table whatever you wish. Bring your offerings.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious and generous God, you love us more than we love ourselves. Free us from all that binds us so that we might know you and love you, love you more fully and truly. We thank you for the many gifts that you have given us this season expressed here on this stage. And we ask that each of these gifts be used for your purposes. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand and sing our final hymn, We Plow the Fields and Scatter, number 747. Now hear these words of blessing and benediction. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will abide in you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>